Well, good morning and welcome everyone. It's a beautiful day outside. Have great, great, great sunshine out there. A little bit of a warm up here. Kind of took us out of that deep freeze we dropped down into last week. So that's a very, very refreshing change. And, and uh, so we look forward to this, uh, again, uh, nice, bright light out here in the midst of uh, darkness in the world. Hey, we've got a lot of great things coming on. As you can see by the slide up here, we have a candlelight service coming up, and that'll be Christmas Eve right here at 11 o'clock p.m. And uh, so we will have candles and everything set up back here, sing some Christmas songs, and we'll have uh, a short service to uh, share with everyone there and just have a good time of fellowship together. So we're hope hopefully everyone will be able to make it. We're going to try and see what we can do to live stream it, but with the music restrictions that they have, they usually cut off the live streams, and so we've got to be very cognizant of that as we're doing here today. We have to kind of move our service around a little bit to fit in with the rules for streaming. So, uh, movie night. So we're going to have movie night here January 9th at 6 p.m. We're going to see the movie Do You Believe, and it's a wonderful, wonderful film, I have to say and uh, really looking forward to that. Uh, a lot of great time to be able to share with our uh, families and everything. We're going to resume then our Bible study on Wednesday nights uh, and uh, resume the Max Cato study at that point in time as well. Uh, once we get through this week and next week, obviously we got a lot of things going on here. So uh, some great times ahead and some good opportunities for fellowship and service to our uh, fellow believers in Christ. So 2020 is almost over. Can you believe that? This year's kind of flown by in one aspect of things and otherwise you're just going to go on, oh man. It was kind of overwhelming at times, but the neat thing about it was through it all, through everything that we've been through with COVID and, and the derecho and all the repairs and everything that we've been having to do, you know, God was right there with us the entire time taking our hand and walking with us through all the challenges that we face. And uh, that is just awesome to have that power, that, that love of God being with us through all these things. So I would like to start us off this morning with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Father, we ask you to richly bless Pastor Terry and the message you have given him to share with us today. May it bless us today to your glory. We praise you and thank you for the life you have so richly given us. And we stand in awe of your goodness and mercy today. And we invite you to be present amongst us right here this morning by the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you have made the way through our love that is known through your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would reveal this great love to us all here today as we gather to worship. Lead us by your spirit to praise you, and may our hearts overflow with thanksgiving. And our mouths proclaim your everlasting greatness. Thank you for the incredible blessing of being your sons and daughters, for the intricate and beautiful creations you have made us to be, Lord. We give you all that we are, and we ask that you would bind with us in your spirit today. And we open our hearts that you might fill them with new love, Open our minds that you would pour fresh hope into our thinking and lift up our souls that they may bathe in your grace. We lift up our hands and voices to sing your praises. And as we come to worship and adore you today, Lord, we honor and cherish the fact that you are our Lord, our Savior, and our Redeemer. And today we offer our whole beings in worship to you. In your precious and holy name we pray. So our call to worship today comes again from the prophet Isaiah. And this came, as I had mentioned in a couple weeks ago and in my sermon uh, two weeks ago, uh, three weeks ago, three, yeah, three, uh, that this message was given to the prophet Isaiah 700 years in advance of the coming of Christ. And it's really important to know that God works throughout time. And God is, as the scriptures say, he is everlasting to everlasting. And so 700 years to him is, is like five seconds to us. And so we need to understand that, that God is there and at work in our lives each and every day, even though he is everlasting. 
Our time may be finite here on earth, but through him and through the redemption of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have that promise of everlasting life to be able to be and abide with God forever in heaven. And all it takes is belief and faith for us to receive that blessing that he gave us and to live it out each and every day of our lives. So let's listen to the words of Isaiah. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, and for unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. See, in a time of great darkness, God promised to send that light that would shine to everyone, everyone. It took away the separation of Jews and Gentiles, and he was here to shine that light for everyone. Because at that point in time, they were all living in sin, and they were living in the shadow of death, and it was a dark time. And this light was a person. This light was a person who would be both that wonderful counselor, which is uh, another term for being all loving, one who is distinguished and exceptional, without peer, the one who gives right advice. So when we have our problems and we have the things that we face each and every day, God is with us always. And through the Spirit, we know that He will give us the advice that we need. Wonderful Counselor. Everlasting Father. He is timeless. And he is our God and He is our Father. All powerful, mighty God. He is God himself, incarnate through Christ and living amongst us. And the Prince of Peace, his government is one of justice and peace. See, this message of hope was fulfilled in the birth of Christ and in the establishment of his eternal kingdom. He came to deliver all people from the slavery of sin and death. And Isaiah names four names to call to worship to describe the Messiah, the Deliverer, the one who is coming to bring us back home to God. See, and it's more than just when we die, it's to bring us back into that right relationship with God, a life of righteousness. That's what that word means, to have a right relationship. And so he uses these four names to call those people to describe the Messiah so they knew who he was when he came. And these names hold special meaning for those who hold Christ dear and near in their hearts each and every day. Our Redeemer, our Savior, Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. So as we come to this time in our Advent, it is week number four. And uh, we get to light our candles today. <laughs> yeah. Today is the fourth Sunday in the season of Advent. In anticipation of the coming Christ, each week we light another candle of our Advent wreath. This morning we light the fourth candle, and we wish for the world to know the promise fulfilled in our King, the Prince of Peace, the Wonderful Counselor. And we say, many are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us, too many to declare. As we reflect on the wonder of the promise of Christmas, we give thanks that all of God's promises to us are fulfilled in the birth, life, and death of Jesus. And we rejoice in God's faithful love, which brings us immeasurable joy. Today, we celebrate the joy that is ours in the promised Christ, God with us. And from Matthew chapter 1, 18 through 23, we read, This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. 
But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Good morning, church. That's much better than the little bit of a fire that we had last week. So, good to see that. It's good to see you all here. For those of you that are joining us for the first time online or in person, welcome. We're so glad that you could be with us here this morning for this message on Advent. I'm blessed to be here this morning. Um, most of you know that I had surgery on Monday to have a little device implanted. Breathing has been interesting this week. Just another reason to give glory to God. Amen. So I'm so thankful for that. This morning, we are so close to Christmas. It's this Friday. It doesn't feel like it, does it? It seems like we just got locked down on quarantine. And yet now we're starting to see people who are getting vaccinations and we're starting to see some of those numbers come down and we can only give praise to the Lord who provided the doctors and the researchers who created the vaccines and for the people who are taking the time to uh, do what they need to do um, to stay safe and we thank them for that. This reminds me of gifts, of presents. And so I'm going to ask you a rhetorical question. I want you to think about what is the best present you ever received? Did you know what it was before you got it? Or was it a complete surprise? Now, as a child, that could have been any number of things. It might have been a specific toy or a bike or even a pet. But what about as an adult? And as you're thinking about that, how do you measure the value of a gift? Is it by its worth? Is it by how big it is? How much it weighs? How much, how much usefulness you'll get out of it? Here's another question as you're thinking about that. Has how you measure the value of a gift changed as you've gotten older? Has it changed along your walk with Christ. Because that's going to be the part that we're going to get into today. Now, I think about a lot of different things. I think about what are some of the reasons that um, you get someone a gift? Unfortunately, these days, it seems like it's almost all too often out of obligation. They got me one. I better get them one and I better spend just as much money as they spent on me because, you know, don't want to cause any hard feelings. And this could be for birthdays, for anniversaries, and more specifically, we're talking about Christmas right now. And this leads me to think about everything that we've been seeing on TV, 
everything that you know you get in the mail. Now, granted, the mail's been a little slow lately because they're a little low on workers because of sickness right now. But we're seeing these ads. In fact, I got an email today from Best Buy saying, "You got here's the perfect gift for your kid: a PS5. Buy it today for this price." It's like, yeah. No. And then I think about all of the different Christmas shows and movies that are out there. And what are they doing? They're pointing us towards materialistic things. They point kids to things that they think they want. And they give an exaggerated response to the kids. And, and, and then ultimately the parents that think the kids need to have these things. But do we really need them? Now, I don't know about you, but we're going through this season in life where our house is too full. And it's not just, it's not gifts. It's just stuff that we bought over the years. We don't need it anymore. There's so much stuff. But that brings us to the thought of what are the gifts that we should be giving? Now, I'll admit, I was probably one of those kids that wanted all the toys in the toy catalog. I probably had the catalog laid out on the floor in the living room. And if you're old enough, you're going to remember these, the Sears toy catalog. That was my favorite. Open it. It was like almost as sick as the regular catalog. Open that puppy up, grab a Sharpie, start circling. In fact, I remember one Christmas, we were at my aunt and uncle's. And I opened up one of the gifts. And, you know, you're opening up gifts. And it's like, wow, that's great. Okay, what's the next one? I got this antique. It, it, it was a new metal cast tractor. But it was, it was made like an antique one that had the metal wheels on it. I already had one. This ungrateful little brat threw a hissy fit. I already have one of these. I got really upset about it. I didn't get it. Now I get it. As parents, and, and now as grandparents, we want to spoil the kids and the grandkids. The problem with that is, is, again, stuff is just stuff. So how do we determine what is the perfect gift? I went to Google because I wanted to know. Because Google knows everything, right? Alexa usually tells me I can't answer that. So I went to Google. Google gave me over 2.7 billion results of the perfect gift. Now, that tells me that none of those are the perfect gift. They're worldly things. I don't believe that any of those are a perfect gift. And, and what I do believe, and this has come through years, through my walk with Christ, that God showed us the perfect gift. And it was a gift that was given through love. In, in this morning's call to worship, Pastor Mark read this, read from it to us from Isaiah 9, 6. And it says, for unto us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now Isaiah's prophecy from hundreds of years before was about the gift that God was going to be sending to us. It was telling us about Jesus' coming and about his four royal qualities. Wonderful counselor, coming to advise his people. These are gifts that we need. We need advice. Mighty God, coming to protect his people. Everlasting Father, coming to care for his people. And finally, Prince of Peace, coming to bring peace to his people. Now, this is a gift that even the people then and now just don't understand. See, Jesus teaches us more about the meaning of this passage when he advises us. He shows us how he is here to protect us, how he cares for us, and how he brings us peace. And this all wraps into one verse. Now, there's more to this verse, and I'm, we say this all the time, Pastor Mark and I. Read around it. Read after it. But go to John 3.16 if you have your Bibles. And this is from the New Living Translation. It says this, For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, 
but have eternal life. There's a gift. Now, here, I, I've got some, some uh, sections to this. And this first one, you might look at me a little bit funny when you hear this. But his gift, God's gift, was a surprise. Now, just think about that for a moment. It was a complete surprise. Continue holding that thought and, and let me explain this a little bit. See, we all know the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah and about Jesus' birth. From, uh, from Genesis twenty two eighteen, 18, we read that he comes from the line of Abraham. And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. And then it goes down to his grandchild Jacob in Numbers 24, 17, I see him. But not here and now, I perceive him, but far in the distant future. A star will rise from Jacob, a scepter will emerge from Israel. It will crush the heads of Moab's people, cracking the skulls of the people of Sheth. And we keep going down the line. We get to 2 Samuel 7, verses 12, 13, where we hear that he comes from the line of David. For when you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for my name, and I will secure his royal throne forever. And then we learn that he was going to be born in Bethlehem. Micah 5, 2 says, But you, O Bethlehem and Phosra, are only a small village among all the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past, will come from you on my behalf. And then we learn that he will be born to a virgin in Isaiah 7, 14, when it reads, All right then, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. This whole story that, that we read in the Gospels plays out here. He is worshipped by shepherds and foreign kings. Psalm 72, verses 9 and 10. Desert nomads will bow before him. His enemies will fall before him in the dust. The western kings of Tarshish and other distant lands will bring him tribute. The eastern kings of Sheba and Seba will bring him gifts. And then even after his birth, we read about Herod sending the soldiers to slaughter the children. This was prophesied in Jeremiah 31, 15, where it reads, this is what the Lord says. A cry is heard in Ramah, deep anguish and bitter weeping. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children are gone. And then certainly when Jacob is warned in a dream to go to Egypt in Hosea 11, 1, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt. He brings him back out of Egypt, back to Israel, where he will go to Nazareth. And certainly we know the scriptures say that he will be called a Nazarene. Now, until we're introduced to all this, and until we study this, and until we understand it, we don't realize what this gift is, let alone how great it is. So that's where the surprise comes in. To the Jews, they were the elect. They basically, it was like no, no outsiders allowed. They had a very much a, a country club attitude, a, a country club type atmosphere, much like many of the churches today. And, and it wasn't so much, what can we do? So as a church, as Great Street Church, we asked, what can we do for our community, outside of our four walls. We did this at Thanksgiving when we provide, provided, you know, 50 plus meals to the 11 different REM homes and some of the, the shut-ins that we know. That's stepping outside of ourselves. That's taking God's love to others. But it was more for them and many for many churches, it's what can you do for me? I don't like the way you worship. I don't like the music you sing. I don't like the color of your carpet. 
Trust me, color of carpet has raised more problems in churches than you would believe. And, and, and it goes further. When Jesus is back in this verse and he says, for this is how God loved the world. This is not something the Jews talked about a lot at all, how much God loved them, let alone loving the entire world around them. But the Old Testament, it tells us a very different story. It tells us that God chose the Jews to be his children, to be his messengers to the world, to share his message of love with the whole world, not just amongst themselves. And he does this in a way where he sends us a gift and he does it in the most humble of ways. Listen to how Luke records this in, in 2, 1 through 7. He says, At the time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the entire Roman Empire. Now, this was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. And he traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Now let that sink in. Strips of cloth. Now, when we think of getting our brand new babies when we're at the hospital, they're all cocooned up in that nice little blanket, kept real nice warm, and they may even get to lay underneath those heat lamps or they stay nice and warm. No, 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 no. That's not what happened here. See, he was laid in a manger, in a stable. Now, if we think about the strips of cloth and how he was probably wrapped, it was probably done as best that Mary could do with what she had. So think about this. Think about presents you've actually seen. Think about things you've seen online where, as a world, we like to mock others, right? So we're going to see uh, pictures or actual wrappings uh, and presents uh, that are held together by you know, maybe lots of scotch tape maybe even electrical tape. If you're a big red-green fan, maybe even duct tape. And now you can get duct tape that might even match the wrapping that you're using. Sometimes you might see things wrapped in newspaper, maybe tied together with a string. Now for me, that actually elicits some neat memories because I remember a big gift that I got from my, my mom and dad, and it was wrapped in a newspaper. It was actually wrapped in the comics, but it was too big for any wrapping paper. So I got it. It, it just elicits a nice memory for me. But we think of things, and how could, how could anybody wrap a gift like that? And, and when we think of gifts that are under the tree, we think of how that wrapping, you know, now, you may not do this. Some people do. They, when they wrap a gift, they wrap it in such a way that it meets the personality of the person that they're giving it to or it matches their own personality, right? So it might be uh, wrapped in a big, bright, shiny paper with a huge bow or ribbon. And then these gifts are placed under or near the Christmas tree. But let's go back to this gift that God gave us. His gift that was wrapped in strips of cloth Stable, manger. Now, get this thought in your mind. Have you, if you've ever been on a farm, if you've ever been out to the barn, you're gonna know what I'm talking about. Okay, so animals are not clean. They're dirty, they smell. And this manger that Jesus was leaving them was a feeding trough. And all they had to put underneath him was the straw from the floor. Now. Animals don't use the bathroom like we do. They just kind of go wherever they go. So this straw, been trampled on, been used for their facilities, been put under the baby Jesus. Mm 
This is supposed to be the king of the world, our king come to save us. Yet he's wrapped in strips of cloth in this dingy, dark stable laid in a dirty manger. Pretty humble surroundings. Pretty humble way to start life. This is not what the Jews expected. In fact, they just, they, I don't know how they could did not, not listen to the, the Old Testament prophets and, and, and you know, what we now have as the Old Testament and the writings from it, because it, it says all these things. We talked about this. We already went through those, some of those passages. But they came to the idea that Jesus was just going to appear out of nowhere and take over and win back their country for them. Now, the fact that he was born in a manger, or born in a stable, laid in a manger, none of this takes away anything from his birth. If anything, it makes it more powerful because this is a sacrifice that God made. He sent his son, who is in heaven, in paradise with him, sends him to earth into those conditions to live life like us. Here's a gift that he gave us that was undeserved. Now think about that. At Christmas and other times throughout the year, we give gifts to people we care about. But when was the last time you gave a gift, especially one of earthly value, to someone you did not know or did not get along with? Romans 5, 8 says this, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. He gave us a gift while we were still his enemies. Not on his side, because he loved us on our side. God gave us the ultimate gift, that gift of eternal life. And here's the thing, he gave it to us with no expectations. He gave it to us while we were still his enemies. It's a gift that we don't deserve. And that gift tells us a lot about him. Think about the gifts that you've been given. Now we try our very best to plan ahead of time to give someone a good gift, right? All right, Christmas is this Friday. Most of you are probably already done with your shopping. Some of you may already have started for next year. Planning ahead. But trying to find a gift for something they need or something that will have meaning to them, that can be difficult. And then the question comes to my mind is, are these gifts given in love or are they just given to appease? And when I say peace, I mean, are they just given because that's what we do? How often have you gotten out to those final days or weeks prior to, to needing to give someone a gift and you still have no idea what to get them? Now, to be fair, this is complicated by different factors. What the person wants isn't in the budget. They already have everything they need and want. So let's face it, getting gifts for others can make us anxious and feel pressured. That's where I love the lesson my great-grandmother Shenander taught me. The, my memories of her are when she was in the nursing home. All she ever wanted for gifts, two things, a box of Kleenex, a bag of orange slices. She said that's all she needed. That's what she got. When God decided to send us Jesus, it's not something that he was made anxious or stressed by. He had planned this long in advance. It was, it's not something he did on the fly. We know this because scripture tells us this. In John chapter one, verses one through five, it says, in the beginning, the word already existed. Now we know that Jesus is the word and the word was with God. And the Word was God, and He existed in the beginning with God. 
and God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him and the word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone the light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it and the gifts that we give to one another whether we're, they're given because of some place sense of responsibility or out of love or only temporary I mean think about it when you give your gifts to your kids at Christmas or any other time of the year, you give them the gifts and they're on the floor and they're just ripping through them. Boy, that first one, that's a cool gift. Toss it aside, move on to the next. And how often have you given a gift and it was maybe a better, better, you know, fairly good sized gift and they crawled in the box and played in the box instead of with a gift. They didn't understand the gift that was given to them. But for us, there's no greater gift that we could be given than the gift that God gave us. See, this gift that God gave us is one that cannot be left unopened. We must tell others about it. We must share it with others. It is a gift that will never wear out. It never goes out of style. It is eternal. And when I think eternal, I think not limited to time or space. Because God lives not in what we consider our time and space. He lives in eternity. No beginning, no end. So that's where that gift comes from. And it's a gift of love beyond anything that we could possibly imagine. So the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 John 4.19, he says, It all comes back to love. And love always begins with receiving first. We love because he first loved us. When we open that gift of love that he gave us, when we enter into a relationship with Jesus, we are filled with his love. And when we're filled with that love, we can't help it. I mean, it just explodes out of us. We want to share it with everyone. We want people to know what God has given us. We want them to share in that. We want them to go and spend eternity with us. God has loved us since eternity. That reminds, when I think of that, I think of when I was a kid and I would lay on the grass and I would look up into the sky at night and look at the stars. And I had been introduced to the, uh, the term infinity. And I could not, I mean, it made my head hurt looking and knowing that, that there was no end. This doesn't make my head hurt. This makes my heart hurt for those who don't know God. He has loved us since eternity. He teaches us throughout the Bible, his love letter, how we are to love him and how we are to love others. So that brings up a couple of questions as we get to our closing up here. What would you do for your children? Let's take that a step further. Thinking about what God did for his children, how far are you willing to go to show your kids you love them? God sent his son to live a perfect life on earth, enduring all the same things that we endured. He endured them without sin. And in the very end, at the very end, he gives himself as a sacrifice for us out of this same love. He willingly got on that cross and died for our salvation. God's gift, this gift we're talking about this morning, that gift tells us how much he loves us. I challenge you, from the moment you get up from where you're sitting, whether you're at home on the couch in a recliner, here in the church sitting in one of the pews, from the moment that you stand up in fact, before you even get up, what are you going to do to show others God's love? Father, thank you for this love that you have given to us. Father, thank you 
for sending your son. Thank you for this love letter that you've given us, Father. It goes right through and tells us exactly what we need to do. Yes, we understand there's things in here that we may never understand, not here in our earthly home, but we do know that we're just travelers. This is our temporary home. But Father, let us live a life of love, one that shows Jesus' love for others. It's not about, we're not here to condemn others. That's not our job. We're here to show our hope in you, Father. This whole season of Advent has given us messages on hope, on joy and peace, and now on love. All things that we need to be sharing with your, your world. Let us do that. And do it with the same love that you have for us. In Jesus' precious and holy name. Thank you, Pastor Terry. As we prepare for this time of communion, we're drawn into the Word of God, and as we share in this communion, this time of, of offering, where we celebrate that gift of love that God gave for us, we celebrate that remembrance. See, the season of Advent we're, is a time of coming, and we're preparing for the coming of the Christ child. And at the same time, we're preparing for the coming, the second coming of Christ, where he calls us home to that everlasting life. And in our communion time this morning, I call you back to that love, that sacrificial love. The scriptures tell us that there's no greater love than for one to lay down their lives for another. And Christ laid down his life for us out of love, out of love, to save us from sin and death and to give us that promise of life everlasting to become our savior and our redeemer. What greater gift what greater gift can we celebrate this time of Christmas? The Mass, the celebration of Christ himself. So as we come to our time in communion today, I want you to be reminded of that time. And the night before Christ was betrayed, he broke bread with the disciples. And he broke the bread and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise, later in the meal, after he had filled the cup, he blessed the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. And each time that you take of this bread and drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. Do it in remembrance of that love, that sacrifice that he made for us. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Thanks. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you for these gifts. We thank you for that love that you gave to us through your son, Jesus. Though we come through times in darkness, Lord, we just praise you and thank you that you sent that light unto us that would shine, shine into our hearts, shine into our lives, Lord. And Lord, thank you for lighting that light within us. 
that we can shine your light into others. Help us to be a gift to others this day and each and every day of our lives in and through you. Help us to shine your light in the midst of a dark world. In your precious and holy name we pray and we submit ourselves to you today. Amen. Now we come to a time for our prayers for people. Time for God sightings also. And a great God sighting today was Terry was up there preaching this morning. I was just in shock. You had a major surgery this week. I didn't expect to see you here today. So God is working miracles through you and through Mark because I know he's been here before when, you know, he's had troubles and been sick. And, you know, God is just so good to this church. And, and um, last night I was making cookies and uh, on TV came through that um, God gives us friends as lifesavers. And I thought about that for a minute, and I thought, you know, that is just an amazing thought. You know, without my friends and family, you know, how would I get through life sometimes, you know? And he sends them here to comfort each and every one of us, and, and he sends his church. I mean, I'm so thankful to be here at this church, that everybody prays for each other, we love each other, we, we live through our trials together, I am so grateful for all of you. So thank you, God, for letting us be here today. And so is, is anybody else? I know there's a lot of prayer that needs to be. So if anybody has specific prayers for others that they would like, I would like to pray for them. And I have a few, so let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we are grateful to you for all things. And I just want to thank you. For my husband Steve. I pray that you will heal his body and you will also heal his brother Larry who has cancer and went into the hospital this week with pneumonia. I pray you will heal his body also. I thank you for his life as well. I thank you for Carol Nunn who has cancer and is going through chemo this week. I thank you for little David who's my niece's nephew who got a fever this week. He was, he's in the hospital, he had major surgery two weeks ago, and, and you were there with him, Lord Jesus, and you have been comforting him for the last two weeks. And I pray that your comfort will be with him and his healing will be quick, and you will um, just heal his little body, Lord God, and be with Misty and Josh and comfort them as they go through this. And Lord Jesus, I just thank you for the lives of each and every one here and the ones listening and all who are in need of prayer. I pray that you heal their bodies from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet. Be with them and guide them through this life. Give them people in their path to comfort them and guide them and help them to know you, Jesus, for you are God and you are so great and you sent your love to this world that we might share it with others and shout it from the mountaintops and let everyone know that you are God. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Well, we had at least one comment thanking us that we didn't have the fire this week, so thank <laughs> you, Lord. It is my prayer that the messages that you hear from Mark and I, that those do light a fire within you. We've come to that time now where we're going to close off our online portion. And let us do that with this prayer. Heavenly Father, the full meaning of Christmas can be explained in one word, love. It is from your pure love that we receive Christ as our Savior. Your love came down from heaven, born to a virgin, wrapped in strips of cloth and laid in a manger. Your love came to us in the humblest of ways. Your love, your word became flesh and it lived among us. Your son Jesus showed us what pure and complete love is. A love that is extended to Jesus, giving his life for us 
so that we could be right in your eyes. Let our hearts and minds be filled with this truth, and may we be reminded always of your love for us. Now, as you prepare to leave, may the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the perseverance of the wise men, the obedience of Joseph of Mary, and the peace of the Christ child be yours. Let the blessings of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us.